not here to call out his lies. Everybody knows he's a liar. But you I just agree. want to make sure. Joe, you're the liar. I, 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 I want to make sure. You graduated last in your class, I, not first in your I, class. <laughs> I want to make Mr. sure. Mr. President, can you let him finish, sir? No, he doesn't know how to do that. Question Why because, would you answer that question? Because the you question want to put is, a lot of the new question Supreme is, Court justice, the radical question, left. Will you who shut is your, up, man? Listen. Hello and welcome to KGW News at 5 o'clock. We begin with the aftermath of a contentious first presidential debate. Neither candidate shied away from personal attacks in a debate that often sounded more like a shouting match. And at times, moderator Chris Wallace struggled to keep control while frequently having to ask President Trump to stop interrupting. KGW's Pat Doris shows us how Portland got pulled into the debate and what it could mean for all of us. Most presidential election years, Oregon is pretty quiet, pretty much left out of the spotlight. We have voted for the Democratic nominee since 1988. We have only seven electoral college votes compared to California, for example, with 55. And since we're three hours behind the East Coast, most of the time our polls haven't even closed before the election's been decided. But this year, we are front and center because of the ongoing riots in Portland. You had never called for the leaders in Portland and in Oregon to call and bring they, in the National Guard and knock well, off a hundred days of riots. They can, in fact, take care of it if he just stay out of the way. Oh, Look here. Oh, really? Here, oh, really? Here's but the thing. No, no, I that, sent sorry, in the no, wait, U.S. Asked Marshals him a question. to get the killer no, of a young man in the middle of the street, and they shot him. Right. And for three Mr. days, President Trump, Trump, Portland President wouldn't Trump, do anything. I had to send in the U.S. Marshals. They Trump, took care of business. Portland Mayor Ted Wheeler, who has clashed several times with the president over the riots, ripped into him before Wednesday's council meeting. Like a virus infecting our body politic, intimidation and hate are being spread by Donald Trump. President Trump has called out Portland several times in the past, and Oregon political strategist Dan Levy, who has worked with candidates for more than 30 years, expects more before the election. Probably, although, you know, President Trump is losing this race, and so he needs to change the narrative. Uh, he needs to make this a choice between he and Joe Biden. Last night in the debate, he made the debate about himself. And it was rough, rougher than we're used to seeing. But it's not unheard of, says political scientist Jim Moore. In television, we've never seen it for a televised debate. But if we go back to the 1800s, this was the norm for debates for people running for national office. That rough and tumble name calling Abraham Lincoln and Stephen Douglas kind of thing, that was what happened. And people responded to it, they cast their votes, and the country moved on. The country was able to survive it, and in some cases thrive because of it. Levy said the notoriety now is not helping anyone. What do you think this does for the brand of Portland? Uh, Portland's been hurt by this. There, there is no doubt. Um, the casual observer uh, across the country, um, they've not seen or heard much positive about Portland. Regardless of where you stand on the political uh, spectrum, um, unrest, uh, violence, uncertainty, uh, that's not a good brand and it doesn't, it doesn't wear well. Indeed, visitors to Kalispell, Montana will see our city's reputation used by Republicans in a less than flattering way. The national tension on problems here likely makes some in Oregon long for the good old days when presidential election years ignored us. It was quiet and we were out of the spotlight. In Northeast Portland, Pat Doris, KGW News. Another key moment during the debate came up when President Trump was asked to denounce white supremacy and then said this regarding the hate group, the Proud Boys. But are you willing tonight to condemn white supremacists and militia groups sure. and to say that they need to stand down and not add to the violence in a number of these cities as we saw in Kenosha and as we've seen in Portland. Sure, Are you I'm prepared to, to do specifically that, do it? Well, I, go would ahead, say, I would say almost everything I see is from the left wing, not from the right so wing. So what, 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 you you what are you saying? I'm, I'm willing to do anything. I want to see well, peace. Then do it, sir. Say I'm, it. Do it. Say it. Do you want to call them? What do you want to call them? Give me a name. Give me a white name. White supremacists and right like me to condemn? White proud supremacists boys. and right proud, proud boys. Stand back and stand by. 
There was never a clear denunciation of white supremacy, but the Proud Boys got a big boost in notoriety on the national and international stage. Tim Gordon explains who they are and their connection to Portland. You don't have to go back very far to feel the Proud Boys presence in Portland. Their rally in Delta Park last weekend built as an event that would draw thousands, only drew a few hundred. But in August, Proud Boys and others from the alt-right mixed it up with Antifa and other protesters in violent confrontations here. Sociologist Randy Blazak has studied the alt-right and hate groups for years. He says the Proud Boys formed online in 2016, like other similar groups, with an anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim, anti-feminist agenda. With the ascent of uh, Donald Trump really kind of moved into the streets. And one of the best ways to kind of characterize them is that they're sort of the modern equivalent of the racist skinheads of the 1980s and 1990s. Blazak says it's unclear how many Proud Boys there are. Its members are spread throughout the country, but some live in this area and others like to visit. Uh, because Portland has a pretty strong anti-racism community uh, and a progressive community that's brought the, the kind of attention of the people on the right, that this is where you want to go to have your fights. The violence has been chilling. Proud boy Alan Swinney was just arrested for what police say he did in August, including shooting and injuring someone with a paintball gun, spraying someone with mace, and pointing a handgun at a counter protester during an intense confrontation. They're not a traditional white supremacist group. They are a nationalist group uh, that trades on white supremacist themes. Would you like me to condemn white Proud Boys? Boys. Ooh, and right Proud Proud Boys. Boys. Stand back and stand by. However you classify them, the Proud Boys have a lot more exposure thanks to the President of the United States. And it's capitalizing on it. Leader Joe Biggs put out the Proud Boys logo with the Stand Back, Stand Down slogan added. The Trump never denounced white supremacy Tuesday night has Republican Congresswoman Jamie Herrera Butler of Southwest Washington tweeting, Last night's debate was the worst I've ever seen. Since it wasn't made clear last night, let me state unequivocally that all of us must reject white supremacy in all its forms and violence by anyone for any reason. The president needs to clarify his remarks immediately. The Southern Poverty Law Center designates the Proud Boys as a hate group. Blazak says it is one of several emboldened to damage our democracy. It's a very threatening uh a moment because th these people are also very armed, as we've seen, and um, there's certainly reason for concern. I mean, this is a fascist movement. Tim Gordon, KGW News. The there is a lot more on the November ballot than the presidential race. One example, Oregon Measure 110. It's being called the Drug Decriminalization Measure. This is the latest TV ad for it. The gist, Measure 110 would remove criminal penalties for low-level drug possession charges, misdemeanors specifically. And it would replace those penalties with a $100 fine. That fine could then be waived if the person seeks treatment. It also promises to beef up treatment options statewide and fund that effort with a surplus in tax revenue from marijuana sales. Earlier, we talked to the man in the ad for Measure 110, Hubert Matthews. He's been sober for nearly a decade and works as an addiction counselor. You're not going to be able to rest your way out of, out of, a, out of a, this drug problem. Just saying, it's just going to cost taxpayers more and more money, and you're not going to get favorable results. At least with treatment, you have a chance to address the disease. But Measure 110 is getting pushback, namely from local recovery groups. Staff at Oregon Recover say the measure over promises its ability to create new treatment options and uses money that could fund other things like schools. We'll have more on the arguments for and against Measure 110 on The Story with Dan Haggerty. That's tonight at 6 o'clock right after nightly news. The deadline to register to vote is coming up quickly. In Oregon, it's October 13th. In Washington, voters have a little more time. The deadline there to register is October 26th. Both states make it easy. You can do everything online. You can also check your registration status online or update your mailing address if you've moved recently. And to learn more about the candidates and the measures you'll be voting on, we have a voter's guide on our website right now at kgw.com. 
In the pandemic today, Oregon reported 220 more new cases and four more coronavirus deaths. That brings the case total to more than 33,000 statewide. This is a look at the daily numbers which have picked up recently. Officials also warn it'll still be another week or two before we fully understand how coronavirus is trending in the state. That's due to disruptions caused by the wildfires. There are only four counties in phase one of Oregon's reopening plan. And on Tuesday, Lincoln County became the latest county to move into phase two. That means businesses like the Bijou Theater in Lincoln City can show movies again. For months, the theater's been selling popcorn and showing movies at their makeshift drive-in. It's really weird. It's like you're waking up from a very long dream and you kind of think, you had your act together when we've done the theater for 24, 25 years, but now we're relearning things again. Workplace outbreaks contributed to a large majority of the cases in Lincoln County, which had held the county back. Multnomah, Washington, Clackamas, and Malheur counties are still in phase one.